We don't have so much time, and it's a very important topic we want to address here today, the International Partnership for Blue Carbon, working together to deliver outcomes for climate, the environment, and people. Um, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here, the moderator today, but uh, first of all, I welcome uh, Mr. Jenny Eberse, the Ambassador for the Environment of Australia. I'm very happy that the Australian Pavilion is hosting us here. And uh, the Ambassador for the Environment that is the Senior Officer with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And most recently, he was First Assistant Secretary of Humanitarian Non-Government Organizations and Partnerships Division. And um, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, um, it's great to have such a fantastic panel. Um, it's also great to have the uh, cabinet secretary here. Uh, I've uh, I've been uh, provided with a, a Scottish uh, um, mask, which uh, you know uh, allows me to sort of bring a bit of my Scottish heritage out. So um, it's great to be able to be here together for this event. I think um, I, I guess you know on focusing on blue carbon. Um, it's the uh, International Blue Carbon Partnership, something that Australia uh, was key in terms of uh, working to uh, establish back in uh, 2015. Um, we know that increasingly realising how critical blue carbon is to climate action, both in terms of its role in uh, you know, sequestering carbon um, and being a sink for, 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 for carbon, but also it's critical biodiversity roles and its broader role as well in terms of supporting climate adaptation. Um, you know, the partnership that Australia's had with many countries in our region, particularly in the Pacific, with Indonesia, uh, with Philippines, with others, and Sri Lanka has been really key in terms of sharing knowledge and expertise in blue carbon. I think one of the things that I said this morning when we discussed nature-based solutions, so, you know, uh, though the concept blue carbon might be uh, relatively new, um, you know, uh, nature-based solutions, managing our oceans, managing land is something that's been going on for millions of years. And one of the things which I increasingly realise in my role as ambassador is just how critical indigenous knowledge and indigenous experience is in managing land, managing, managing our coastlines, and including blue carbon. Um, Australia has a, a very rich history of, 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 of Indigenous communities uh, as we're dealing with the increasing challenges we face with climate change, realising how critical drawing on and, and, and uh, uh, increasing the uh, engagement with Indigenous communities and that knowledge uh, both in Australia and internationally has been critical. The government's announced uh, today the Bloom Carbon Accelerator Fund which is a fund that is going to look at how we um, invest and accelerate um, uh, research uh, and pipeline projects in blue carbon. Uh, uh, the government uh, announced uh, um, over the last few months the establishment of a new Indo-Pacific carbon offset scheme. And one of the ideas with that is looking at how we can also provide funding and financing for blue carbon issues um, uh, in our region to try and incentivize greater private sector investment and how that can really uh, generate uh, income and revenue for local communities uh, who benefit from uh, that going forward. I want to uh, particularly highlight as well the partnership we have with the IUCN um, uh, in, in, in the oceans and the carbon work. The government announced a $100 million oceans package a few months ago. And part of that though, has got a strong focus on our own sort of uh, oceans and coastlines. It is very much also driving uh, the work that we want to be and are doing, as mentioned, in our region in uh, sharing the latest science knowledge on the scaling of the blue carbon efforts going forward. So again, thank you. Um, it's great to be able to uh, uh, be here um, and also have the chance to both have people participating uh, in in, uh, in person, but also virtually as well. Many thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, much uh, Ambassador. And now I will um, hand over to um, Marie Gogar, who is the uh, Permanent Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands in the Scottish Government. And within the IPCC, the, uh, one of the newest members here. And we are very happy that Scotland is now part of the IPCC. 
and that we can uh, work more closely together. So, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, to, to Jamie, first of all, and colleagues at the UNESCO International Partnership for Blue Carbon for uh, inviting me to join you today because it really is great to be here at the Australia Pavilion, but of course we have a lot in common that we want to discuss. Just telling Jamie as we came in about our very important Bond Scott and ACDC connections with Scotland, uh, <laughs> for one. Um, so really on behalf of Scotland, I really just want to welcome you all to Glasgow whether you're joining us here in person or to those joining us online. And it really is just fantastic to be able to connect with delegates from around the world on this important topic of blue carbon. Now, we're really proud of our climate action and our climate ambition in Scotland. Scotland was one of the first countries to declare a climate emergency, and that was in 2018. And we are committed to a just and fair transition by to net zero by 2045. But of course, we recognise that we can't do that alone. Now, as we know from the discussions at COP26, climate change is a global issue that requires a global effort to tackle it. And international collaborations have a hugely important role to play in bringing people together to work towards that common goal. And in fact, the interconnectedness of the ocean, I think, is a great symbol of the need for us all to work together. And that's why I was so pleased to accept the invitation for the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum to join the UNESCO International Partnership for Blue Carbon, or the IPPC. Now, multi-stakeholder partnerships like the IPPC are absolutely vital in harnessing the international effort to understand blue carbon habitats, to really drive that global commitment and improve policies for their protection, as well as for their restoration. And I'm also delighted that our work with the partnership commences right away. Next week, we will welcome blue carbon scientists, stakeholders, investors, and policymakers to Edinburgh for the two day international conference entitled Blue Carbon Beyond the Inventory. And I know you'll hear more about the conference from the chair of the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum, Professor Bill Austin, later in this event. Now, today our oceans have absorbed 90% of the heat of man made climate change and they play a vital role in absorbing CO2. In Scotland, we estimate that our seas store as much carbon as all of our land sources. And as we heard throughout yesterday, ocean action is climate action. All evidence shows that the climate and biodiversity crises that the world faces are intertwined. A warming climate is harmful for nature. And these negative impacts on nature will exacerbate climate change. No more so is this the case than in our ocean. Marine nature-based solutions offer the triple benefits of helping people, helping the environment and helping the planet. As we emerge from a global pandemic, investing in marine nature-based solutions has the potential to create green jobs and with the right frameworks, a fairer and more prosperous society for all, as well as a thriving blue economy. In Scotland, we are showing leadership. That reflects our determination to really lead by example in tackling the climate crisis. And it reflects that our sea area is six times the size of our land and also the importance of our seas to our economy, to our culture and to our heritage. 37% of our seas are already designated as marine protected areas and will designate at least 10% as highly protected areas by 2026. Our mapping of Scotland's blue carbon will be used as one of the criteria for selecting sites for these highly protected living areas. It's been really positive this week at COP26 to see increasing attention on the ocean and the potential of marine nature-based solutions to provide climate change mitigation and adaptation. And yesterday saw the launch of two new groups, the Cross UK Blue Carbon Evidence Partnership that we're looking forward to playing a role in, and the UK Blue Carbon Forum. And we heard this morning from Australian Minister for the Environment, Susan Lay, and also from Jamie about Australia's new Climate Resilient by Nature programme and Blue Carbon Accelerator Fund. And I really welcome these developments and the leadership that's been shown by Australia. More countries have also included marine nature-based solutions in their nationally determined contributions and are making commitments to conserve, manage, and restore their coastal wetlands. In Scotland, our indicative nationally determined contribution published in July includes blue carbon, 
And through the research of the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum and working across the UK, we're building the evidence base for the inclusion of salt marsh and seagrass in the UK greenhouse gas inventory. And that will be critical, uh, it'll be a critical development in helping drive restoration of these habitats and attracting private investment as we've seen following inclusion of the woodland. Now we have to ensure that the commitments that are made here at COP26 and those that have been made before that are delivered in full. Through the IPDC, we can exchange expertise on research and policy, we can build the solutions and we can take actions and benefit from the experience and expertise of the global community. So overall, and for the benefit of our ocean, we can work together to accelerate implementation of global blue carbon protection and restoration activities. And I would just like to recognise the work that's gone into the IPPC since its launch at COP21 in Paris, and to thank the Australian government for driving this forward. We're delighted to be the newest member and look forward to working closely with all of you in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth Secretary. And now I am um, over to Lagneria uh, Benin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, my, my boss, um, <laughs> um, as I see, is also together with uh, Australia coordinating this initiative. Um, I get the floor to you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Uh, you know, uh, well, I'm not a boss, you know, and I see it's impossible to be a boss because there are so many talented people who really know what needs to be done. Just not to be in the way is the, is the approach. But like really to thank uh, our Scottish and Australian friends for doing our common work, which is so critical for climate. You know, uh, you know we, are, we are trying to find solutions, and, you know, and we have started this work from, I would say, hard science, understanding the type of balance, uh, trying to understand how temperature is, is moving in the ocean. Um, you, know, all, you know all the statistics, 90%. I don't want to uh, again to, to, to present it to you because you know it all. But you know, uh, in the situation uh, now is developing the following way, that we are now discussing this ocean map uh, in, in, in COP26. Uh, the main idea is to get to the 1.5 degree. And uh, it is very difficult. And I would like to say that uh, uh, at this critical junctures, it is where uh, good solutions maybe just start to move forward. Because, you know, people really understand that it's now necessary. So once again, we all know that carbon is a win-win. It is a win for carbon. It is a win for ecosystems. And uh, uh, we, I think we, uh, when we, uh, I also met it. Emily in 2015 for the first time because it was the time when, when I was appointed the, at the position of executive secretary. And then we started this initiative in 2015. And the, this COP is actually where we have to analyze where we are. So I think where we are now, first of all, we, I think, have good in inventory. We clearly know the, uh, what is happening with the carbon, with all these percentages. We know how it's happening in, 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 in many countries. And then also, I think we created a situation where it is possible now to uh, give uh, the blue car uh, a platform for, for moving forward because of the, uh, of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So uh, if you all heard about that decade, just wanted to mention one important thing. Once again, it's the same paradigm. We started with the hard science. And the hard science was, is usually organized in such a way the scientists say, it's an interesting problem. I will do it. The decade of ocean science for sustainable development is to engage everyone in solving the real issues to understand what is necessary to solve, to engage science to solve this and really solve that. And this requires a different approach because uh, we don't have a framework convention on climate change. We don't have any convention that would be really promoting a making science mandate. We have to engage everyone. And we see people engaged. And, you know, uh, we just came from uh, Japan, Pavilion, and people spoke there about the need to, to also actually put the public carbon, despite it was not even planned. And they just can relate here on that, but also on oceanification and many other things. And people spoke about this uh, also from the societal point. This is where the solution lies. And people understand 
But this is uh, really a critical matter. Even, I would say, number one, the <laughs> countries that starting to understand how critically close we are to uh, really irreversible losses. So, and with the data portion science, we are creating a platform for addressing the science needs for, for, for the solution, including new carbon. And uh, on the 15th of October, we issued the second call for decade actions. The deadline uh, for uh, submissions is 31st of January 2022. There are three priorities. Ocean, uh, clean ocean, that means understand and uh, fight the uh, uh, Ocean health ecosystem, this is so relevant for, for carbon and all, 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 all the ecosystems that we speak about, and ocean climate nexus. So you here are basically, you know, well, the recipients of that whole. So I think uh, uh, is that I think, uh, and what how the decay works. So we endorse programs, and already is that people come with their resources, and it's possible now to say that we engaged 800 million US dollars in the programs that are now working together towards sustainability without investing a penny. But obviously, it's not able to invest more than than that. But anyway, so there is a new situation now. So I just invite you to, to consider that call and come up with, uh, with, with good ideas. And after that, what happens? We will be organizing our communities of practice. So this will really increase immediately your, um, your community because there are so many communities of practice in terms of observations, in terms of already, by the way, blue carbon, early career ocean professionals. And this is also social dimension, leadership of women in ocean science. Uh, Pacific. So, and with that, we understand what's happening. We try to monitor the totality of, of activities, and with that, I think we'll be able to say what is missing in the pie. And that will be the call number three. And we also analyze what is missing in call number four. And with that, we'll move forward to climate solutions, including the carbon, which is, uh, I think, uh, also a shortcut to so, so many things. So, welcome more and more partners on board. So we started with fewer partners, there are more and more, and this is uh, I think we are going to be. Thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, to all the high level remarks, uh, which I think really set the scene well for going now to solution space, the solution space for climate change and what can we do in the ocean and the coastal areas. And originally, Dorothy was supposed to be part of the panel, but due to the traffic um, complications, uh, Dorothy will now give a few remarks uh, from ISCN um, and uh, then we go further with the panel. Thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm Dorothy Head with the ISCN Global Rate Polar Program. And indeed, um, I might steal Emily's tagline for that. We were in Cancun uh, back in the years talking about the carbon in a big, big side event room with maybe 10 people in the room and five of them were our friends and colleagues. And we were sort of laughed about, oh, not laughed, but smiled at with the idea around coastal carbon. And I think here we are, we can't keep up anymore on where blue carbon is talked about, so uh, which is extremely exciting. And I think indeed today when we launched the Blue Carbon Accelerator Fund, it's another really testimony of the partnerships. And Vladimir talked about that. It is with the uh, international partnership for blue carbon that indeed was also launched at the ISM Pavilion uh, at the COP in Paris, as he said. So quite fitting that we're here now in the Australian Pavilion. So how can we work with our partners to really help the projects of the members uh, of the international partnership for blue carbon? It's really about getting to the people, to uh, positive impacts for nature, measurable impacts. We want to really show how this is tangible, how this contributes to mitigation, but also adaptation and all the other ecosystem services, because I think carbon is a big driver, but as we heard from many speakers, um, there is this big story to tell about the multiple benefits of this coastal ecosystem. So in that sense, please stay tuned. You will hear more about uh, how this develops. The first calls are planned for um, early next year, and then really hope again in, in a year's time or so to take stock where we stand with the project and report first results. So thank you very much. And thank you again also to all the partners that we've been working with uh, throughout the years, especially IOC, UNESCO and Conservation International. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy. And uh, yeah, indeed, 
does he bring one partner of the intergovernment uh, NGOs, but the, this partnership really uh, comprises many different types of stakeholders, and I'm very happy that our panel really also shows the variety we, we have here. And with that, I, I will uh, hand over to the first panelist, and, uh, the, um, Professor Berlossen from the Scottish Procurement Forum, on behalf of the Scottish Procurement uh, Government, I would like to hear what you think, what this partnership can bring to the Scottish, uh, yeah, to the Scottish people, but also how that exchange can happen. Because a partnership, as you all know, is a two-way street. There's a give and take, and I think that's important. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me say and echo the comments from our cabinet secretary. It's a wonderful thing to be part of this partnership. And uh, particularly, I think for Scotland as hosts uh, here in Glasgow of, of COP26, uh, this is a wonderful uh, timing. Uh, it's also wonderful for me, I'm an academic, uh, an oceanographer by background. Uh, we work by partnership naturally in terms of our collaboration. So to think about uh, today as a day for nature and the opportunities, I think, to collaborate uh, for nature is great. Um, the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum uh, was formed by Scottish Government uh, in 2018 and um, is a collection, a pooled collection of academics primarily, but working with uh, Marine Scotland uh, in, in a partnership. And we've been very fortunate to fund a cohort of early career researchers. So we have a series of PhD students, some are in the room today, so I'm delighted to see uh, some of them here. And this has been a very effective way of, I think, uh, building our blue carbon research base in Scotland and building partnerships within Scotland. Um, the Blue Carbon Forum itself has been able to inform government policy, and we've been very excited to hear the recent announcements about marine protection measures and uh, the ideas of protecting our subtidal carbon stores. This is very exciting for me in particular because our meeting, our conference next week is a blue carbon beyond the inventory. So we're here at COP to think about a framework in which we have to work around climate mitigation opportunities for the blue carbon habitats that we know and understand. But I think there's an opportunity here and we've been active in, in Scotland in thinking and reimagining our seas and the way that we can manage our seas to protect uh, these vast stores that the cabinet secretary spoke of. And these will involve all sorts of new ways of thinking about partnership of stakeholders and the challenges that these will bring to policy, I think are uh, quite significant, but also very exciting. So we're very much looking forward as the newest member to welcoming many people in the room, um, including our colleagues from the Blue Carbon Initiative, uh, Emily, and others uh, to this conference at our National Academy next week. And this will be, I think, a great opportunity and launch pad for our Scottish Blue Carbon Forum. So thank you uh, for our membership. Thank you, and I think I, I will stay just seated because the timing is a little bit busy. But the next one, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, you are here, Catherine Navlock uh, from the University of Queensland. Um, a colleague I met really the first time as well when I entered the Blue Carbon Space nine, nine years ago. And, and uh, also from, from your perspective as an uh, Australian scientist, what does this partnership bring to you and how can you what do you all see in the future to, to further develop? Um, the partnership's been great to uh, facilitate um, science in Australia, more science, right? And it really sort of focuses our attention. But um, I, I suppose one of the uh, products that we launched this morning that has been an outcome, and it's sort of engaged uh, a range of, uh, again, partnerships are key, right? 
So a collaborative effort to uh, help to interpret the 2013 IPCC guidelines for incorporating coastal wetlands into inventories, to interpret that for, um, for countries so that they can use it more easily. Right, so the partnership's been great in helping us translate sort of science into really sort of like usable products, I suppose. So this one that uh, Steve over here is also a co-author, but it, it, I mean, it, it sort of like provides um, like practical advice about how you go do it because we've had the 2013 supplement that says keep your coastal wetlands in your inventory for a long time and yet it's poorly... Um, you know, like not many countries do it. And that's because it's hard. You know, like we're talking about ecosystems that often are data poor, that people haven't really understood that well, that it's very uh, often, you know, like limited knowledge of how they've changed over time. So it's really difficult. And because they're often in that weird sort of land sea boundary, they've also been difficult to manage because who manages them? Is it the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, for example, in Indonesia, or the Forestry Department? So, you know, there's a lot to get over. It's a wicked problem uh, managing them. And I think the partnership's been great in trying to draw the resources together such that it's it, it, like that we've got some chance of action. Because, you know, the first step is to get those ecosystems in the inventory. For example, in Australia, if they're not in the inventory, we can't put them in the market, in the Australian carbon market. So there's like one step, then the next. So I think the partnership's been great to try and really assemble that fundamental kind of practical information that you need to move forward. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think it's really all it's something what we try to enforce even more with, with the BCAF and, and new products to, to be drafted and to be launched in the future. Um, uh, the next panelist, and I'm very happy that she's sitting next to me, is uh, Emily Pitchin from Conservation International, a long standing partner with IOC, but also with the IPCC. Um, and uh, from, yeah, what is for you within that partnership? What makes it unique? Where do you think uh, we should be developing in the future? And um, where you see the, the collaboration between? Um, NGOs, IGOs, and, and countries. So um, it's funny, we, uh, Vladimir just was referring to the fact that he and I met at the Paris Climate Accord, and we, he and I met and then immediately sat either side of the Australian minister when he announced the IPPC. So it's sort of, uh, it was, uh, it's very, um, uh, it's fun to, uh, to be thinking about that and, and to reflect on Dorothy's story that just 12 years ago, uh, she and I and then Steve, we've seen the, in the audience, we're sitting in this empty room where we were politely ridiculed for the idea of the carbon. And so to have it be so prominent here is um, it's sort of almost dreamlike in a certain sort of a way. Um, and to sort of see the diversity and the uh, enthusiasm of all the various partners um, and the willingness to come and contribute in such a diversity of ways, I think really uh, shows that the success of Blue Carbon has come from partnerships. And I think the IPBC is, um, was a, a timely uh, institution to come and start to formalize some of those partnerships that have been emerging and quite frankly are the, the sort of the reason for that success. And I think one of the lessons I've learned from being part of Blue Carbon over the last decade is really learning how to speak across disciplines and a willingness to speak across disciplines. So we have the science community, the policy community, the finance community, which we've, we've had to learn new languages and, and really um, the ability to put millions of dollars into Blue Carbon based on good science um, supported by good policy. Um, I think we shouldn't we shouldn't dismiss the uh, complexity and the challenge of being able to do that and that we have all come together to um, train, uh, cross those boundaries and create structures that are, are, are quite world leading. And many other um, uh, 
have not been achieved in many in many other places and it's because of those partnerships so, and so I think that if we're talking about going into the future I think we need to continue to build and diversify but also to make sure that we um, uh, are well aligned as we get bigger and I think that's our next big challenge and so, for instance, um, Conservation National has just produced some of the first BCS certified carbon credits out of mangroves in Colombia. And we're selling those credits for more money than basically any other nature-based um, uh, ecosystem on Earth, because we all know blue carbon credits are the Tiffany's credits that come in the blue box. Um, but we have to make sure that everybody else produces credits of that quality so that we can consistently maintain that value, whether it be financial <coughs> value or others. And that, that requires us um, creating the tools such as the ones that Kat has been and Steve have been leading on, but then holding ourselves accountable to maintaining that quality. So I think that the challenge for the ITBC and for all of us who are in this room is to, um, uh, to maintain and in fact increase this collaboration, which will only get more difficult as the questions get more complex. And through that, to maintain the, the quality um, uh, and to maintain this uh, uh, idea that these blue carbon ecosystems are the most super ecosystems and so need to be, to be valued, whatever the currency is uh, as we put it together. Thank you. And, and before we open for questions, as always, of course, uh, our last uh, panelist, Jaka Kamalander, uh, Director of Science and Policy at the Secretariat of the Convention of Wetlands, also from the Convention quite often named. Um, and it's, uh, again, a different type of partner involved in, in this uh, partnership um, and chose a variety and, and we would like to hear what you ask from you, what, what is the partnership bringing to you and how do you think we, we can move forward? Thank you, Kristen. Thanks for having me here. Um, I mean, blue carbon in the way we discuss it here is, of course, a relatively recent term. And at the same time, when the Convention of Wetland was adopted in 50 years, it's at that point in time already uh, effectively provided a global intergovernmental framework for addressing these ecosystems, including their services that relate to carbon, just not explicitly. I'm saying that because the three basic commitments under the convention relate to designating and managing wetlands of international importance. Uh, it relates to wisely using all wetlands and uh, uh, international cooperation uh, on transboundary matters, all of this as a contribution to sustainable development. And because of how wetland is defined in the convention, it applies to all of those systems we now call blue carbon ecosystems, coastal blue carbon ecosystems. So this has existed within the framework of the convention. And I think one thing that has really changed, and I, I think it's safe to say it's partly as a result of the actions of many of the individual organizations here, but also partnerships like IPBC is, is the understanding that it can be applied to those climate outcomes. So the principles remain the same, the criteria for site designation remain the same, the convention process remains the same, but there is an increasing recognition among parties that it can be applied towards climate outcomes if strategically done. And I'll mention a few of those things. Um, one is that um, in, our, in, in the network of, of a, wetlands of international importance, the Ramsar sites. There's 2,500 almost of them in the world, 780 or so encompass blue carbon ecosystems. And now we have resolutions from the conference of parties that recognize the value of that. We have resolutions that encourage parties to designate more sites that include blue carbon ecosystems explicitly for the purpose of climate mitigation adaptation outcomes. And uh, we have a range of tools and guidance uh, uh, on this topic, including very recently a briefing that was prepared by our scientific and technical review panel. Um, we also have within these most recent resolutions a strong encouragement to parties to update national wetlands inventories, which is a core aspect of uh, convention implementation for the purpose of a better estimated uh, 
carbon storage and fluxes in order to update greenhouse gas accounts using the IPCC uh, wetland supplement. And so there's, uh, this, is, this has moved much beyond saying this is important, this has gone into 172 contracting parties prepared to adopt resolutions on this topic. Is there more, more uh, distance to go? Certainly. Does it provide a good foundation to move forward? It would seem so. And I think uh, if you look into the future, we can probably expect much more effort uh, in that area. But maybe I can stop there for now and then come back to more. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, that uh, was indeed showing again that Lucalan is uh, something we have to, uh, which is now included in the UNFCCC, but also in other conventions and uh, the say the, the International Partnership for Blue Carbon also just recently prepared a framework document uh, really summarizing where the blue carbons are sitting in those different international agreements and treaties such as the SDG, uh, and 30 Agenda, uh, Ramsa Convention um, and different instruments under the UNFCCC. But um, just some, yeah, just some questions maybe to all of you as well and um so what do you think are really the q and common misconceptions in blue carbon still existing here in the, when you go to policy makers when you when uh when one tries to implement those those projects uh, yeah, I, th I think one of the dangers at a high level for our political leaders is, um, you know, that bottom line of, of, of the amount of carbon in these systems. And um, there are some misconceptions, I think, about how this fits the framework for a climate mitigation potential. So I, I would say that's a risk. That's something uh, we experienced as the forum developed uh, here in Scotland. Great deal of excitement. Um, I think going beyond the scope of the frameworks and that thinking of the amounts of carbon. And then I think reining back in to realize what the actual mitigation potential uh, could be. And I think the other misconception has been not to connect with nature. So I think, I think this has been a, a fundamental problem of silo thinking, that we haven't quite connected the broader ecosystem thinking. I think that was a point that Catherine uh, made as well. So just to add to that, I, I think that it's not just the politicians that have the, the challenge of understanding the mitigation value of these ecosystems, that the, the carbon stored naturally in them is not necessarily the same as the mitigation potential. That, that's not limited to just the politicians. I completely agree because it's it's a it's a hard to describe what the opportunity is, you know, and I, and I think that's somewhere that we're all going. Um, you know, we, we were trying we we're talking a lot with Papua New Guinea this morning and trying to understand what their opportunity to do um, to enhance their blue carbon storage is um, is really the question that hasn't been answered. But to I think that this is, it's not just good enough to have a mangrove, really, you know, we have to increase the, 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 the global cover. We have to try and recover it, right? That's what it's all about. And, um, and sometimes those opportunities are not ones that people really want to look at very closely because they're complicated. They mean engaging with landholders and um, doing all sorts of um, activities that are, are not you know, super easy. If I can just add two more points to that, two or so, but uh, whether this is misconception or just part of the general situation, this perhaps in some critical places still a view that there's not enough readiness to really do something with this at a greater scale. And I think that does strike me as a misconception because we've heard a lot about all the readiness that does exist. We, we know since decades how to manage these systems. There's institutional jurisdiction and capacity at national level, partly in response to global conventions. There's, uh, there's data systems that can be applied. Uh, there's 
guidance and tools, including guidelines adopted through international frameworks, that there should be a great readiness and willingness to apply. And so, so how to change that? Uh, there's a, a few aspects of it. One thing that's important to remember is that we still struggle a little bit with the sectoral divides that exist. And so while we now have wonderfully extensive discussions on nature and climate at this COP26, this is a huge, huge change from previous ones, I think. Uh, when it comes to compiling national greenhouse gas accounts, they're prepared somehow in this bubble and then, and then managing wetlands of international importance are in that bubble. And if, if the greenhouse gas accounting is done at a certain tier level, the role of these systems looks very small and then you don't pay sufficient attention to them and, and that needs to change and that is the basis for that is to some extent misconceptions and that's the hurdle that needs to be crossed. Yeah, but, uh, just a comment from the floor, um, working, working in the practice of implementing the carbon, um, one thing I found is that we've really stepped up in operationalizing and mainstreaming the concept and now the expectations are very high. You know, for instance, for weather restoration projects, <coughs> many years to plan through the project in, in uh, Pakistan took eight to 10 years from concept to implement. And uh, when I have people come to me and say, look, I've got enough money now. I want to plant 2 million mangroves somewhere in the world by December. <laughs> and so the people have this urgency, which is good to see. But we need to do the planning properly, we need to do a good job, we need to make sure that the outcomes are successful. So we have a little bit of expectations to manage as we develop the pipeline. There's a lot more funding out there now than there was even just a few months ago. But we need to develop the pipeline of projects and whatever to manage expectations. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, I wanted to add that in addition to the carbon elements, I really think we need to work also to. Um, to make those other arguments stronger associated with biodiversity, water quality enhancement, uh, coastal protection. I think they're really critical parts of, uh, of that planning process. And if they're well aligned, then we can get much more out of blue carbon projects than just carbon. And I think that's a really important um, thing that we need to have our mind on you know, as we go forward. Can, can I just comment really quickly on, on, on the point that was made about silo thinking? And, and I think one of the great opportunities at the moment is that the way that we manage our oceans, or perhaps don't manage our oceans, but the way that we do manage that, there's an opportunity to connect there in a way that's quite exciting, I think. And uh, I, I think some appetite for that in the government. Yeah. You know, I think my my my, my thought was happily stolen. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's shared. And then I wanted to say indeed that uh, the new concept of uh, managing the ocean uh, sustainably is now uh, evolving very fast, and it involves uh, uh, such things also like uh, uh, financial consideration, national accounting, and you know we all know that uh, the ocean economy is measured in terms of GDP. But you know, the new things would be uh, to value ecosystems and see how ocean management increases the value of the systems for that or decreases uh, by exploitation. And the third element of national accounting that is promoted by the panel, which Australia is a member, is uh, to try to uh, tangibly imagine how using the ocean is helping people to live better. So these three things are totally changing the paradigm and they're working on a much higher level. And I think now, uh, as you rightly mentioned, the situation is not that um, there is more money now and, there is, uh, and because people started to understand it. So to that, we have to, I think, give a good framework, which blue carbon is fitting perfectly. And then I think we can move forward better than you. Um. We are running, we have to leave a little bit earlier here, but I would like to give the panel, uh, each of you again, uh, maybe a last word for, before I then close, um, what do you really want to see in the next two to five years uh, changing in the 
blue carbon world and, and where do you think we will move and, and uh, yeah what is your yeah aspiration for, for blue carbon projects in the next five years so i think when we started this process the idea was or the question that we started with was how might we use the carbon value of these ecosystems uh, to uh, address climate change and to drive conservation and restoration of those, those ecosystems. And I think we put the, the foundation together. We're beginning to see the resources come in. So now it's time to actually start to see a reverse in the trends of the losses of those systems. So that's what I want to see. Thanks. Um, other than, if I'm allowed to paraphrase the permanent secretary, other than just generally channeling the spirit of Bob Scott here in, in dealing with this, uh, I, I think the next few years, uh, something Steve touched on in his input is that we will see this growing pipeline of really significant projects that will, within a matter of years, actually generate quantifiable benefits that are not just carbon, but also related to water adaptation, resilience, whatever else. And I think that's uh, achievable. And I think the time is there. We see this convergence between the biodiversity dialogue and the climate dialogue. In fact, I just came from an event organized by the CBD where this was very well articulated. So, so I think there's an enormous opportunity. The second point is, is the decade for restoration, for ecosystem restoration that really can and should be harnessed. And it grew out of the forest community. We have seen an amazing commitment to forests. Let's deliver on that commitment. But that in itself is not gonna be enough. You, you're not going to meet the climate goals that are already adopted without peat plants and without blue carbon systems. It cannot be done. Um. Uh, I'm looking forward to a couple of different things. One, I agree with Yoko, I'm really looking forward to a whole lot of restoration, you know, and I'm, um, and I'm, I'm thinking that that's going to be a really big um, uh, movement into the next years once we really, but, you know, critical to this is like identifying where that might occur and then doing the real hard yards to make sure it is totally aligned with what communities want and that communities get something out of it. Because what we don't want to see is a whole bunch of perverse outcomes because there's a whole you know, group of carbon cowboys that want to make a lot of those lovely shiny blue carbon credits without delivering the benefits to communities. So I say we really need to keep our eyes on the prize in that respect. Uh, my hope, my ambition is that the framework for blue carbon will be expanded, that we will re reimagine our shelf seas as very important stores of carbon, and that we will look again at the pressures on those shelf seas, which in some parts of the world are intense, relentless, and need to change. Thank you very much and thank you all for participating. I think it really shows this event that the blue carbon is not restricted to mitigation only. It's a, you have to have a holistic view, including adaptation also within the UNFCCC. I think it was mentioned as well as a great opportunity with those different ecosystem services. Having, having also this holistic view of the different conventions and making showing those win-wins, I think, for, for the different um, for the different treaties uh, when addressing um, uh, blue carbon and especially blue carbon restoration in the future. Um, and they're really having this inclusive and, and listening to those people who live there and not coming from the top down. So I think the speak up will really help to uh, enable those local communities, national communities, to get prepared for proper blue carbon projects, which then can also be marketed. And um, I thank you very much. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Excuse me. Yeah. Yes, sure. Yeah, I understand the health of the health of the nation of the LLC. I'm indigenous from uh, Canada. And I think it's really important that part of this work that you're doing across the streets, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the science uh, input and everybody's uh, 
this one. Uh, I'm really heartened to hear the work that you're doing. We've been working with uh, Steve and uh, Cornelia and uh, BC. Um, I think it's really important to, to remember the indigenous lands and worldview that we have. You know, our, our worldview is centered around sustainability and conservation. The earliest carbon dating for helps of people was more than a thousand years ago. And that's something that we're incredibly proud of were experiential learners, intergenerational transfer of knowledge was down, down through ceremony, song, and through our culture. But I think I, I can't express enough how happy I am to hear about this good work, but please don't forget about the indigenous people. We're, we have a uh, indigenous thing network in Canada. There's over 600 in, indigenous nations across Canada, um, sea to sea to sea. So the West Coast, the Arctic, and the East Coast. And we have a lot to, to bring to the table in terms of ecological knowledge. I really appreciate your, your comments. And I remember, you know, I know Oliver coming to us about 15 years ago and talking about two of the major Pacific tides landing in our back door. We have huge, huge territory. So our territory and our waters are really, really high in the trends. And we're really looking forward to you know, moving in on some of this work. And thank you very much. I just wanted to share that. Thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, I think we all realize the importance of the Indigenous people that work, that live in these uh, ecosystems that we're very blessed to be allowed to um, work in. Um, but it's, we, we, we are very grateful for and honor your uh, bringing that to us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. If I may, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to learn from people who know how to be part of this Okay, thank you.